Okay. Yeah, yeah, Alejandra, thanks, thanks very, very much. Um, let, let me first start by saying um, I really do appreciate that you gave me the opportunity to speak here at the end of the semester, um, partly because I've just been really swamped, of course, with things throughout the school year, and also because I actually wanted to present some brand new research, some brand new ideas that have never been put out there before. So what you're going to see here today is actually brand new. As far as I know, no one's ever either written this down or actually said this in public. So I'm hoping that it's going to pique your interest. Um, simply put, I want to give the story of four Black Caltech alums, some people that graduated back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and hopefully you can see how that might resonate to things that are happening today. So really what I'm hoping is after I kind of give you some of these stories and some perspective, that we can maybe have a conversation about what does this actually mean for today's campus. So let me kind of quickly say, who am I and what motivates me for some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today? Um, I am actually from Los Angeles. I grew up in Los Angeles, I actually grew up in South Central LA. Um, and I was very much involved with things like the academic decathlon and just various clubs on campus, the math clubs, business club, and what have you. I was fortunate enough to graduate valedictorian and I came here to Caltech in fall of 1990. Um, at the time, there really were not a lot of Black students on campus in general, but we were lucky that there were about 14 Black students that came in. And that was the largest class that had come in in maybe 20 years or so. Um, when we all got here, we decided right away that we wanted to start the equivalent of the Black Student Union. It actually is the National Society of Black Engineers, or NSBE, and we had our Caltech chapter. Um, let me say that I'm actually used to being here in aeronautics because a grad student that came in that same year is Danny Howard. He actually is the first Black student to graduate in aeronautical engineering from Caltech and did so in 1995. So I'll talk a little bit more about him later, but I do want to say that if you see here on the lower right hand part of the screen, this is a good number of the Black students that came in in 1990. And this was actually the very first NSB meeting that we had on campus. There were a lot of things that were happening in Los Angeles right about that time. Um, you probably remember that just a few weeks ago, we celebrated, celebrating quotes, the 30th anniversary of the LA riots. Now, if you don't remember all of what happened, um, back in March of 1991, there was an individual named Rodney King. Um, he was pulled over in what was supposed to be a routine police stop, traffic stop. And he was beaten by, I believe it was maybe nine different police officers. Now, what made this different at the time is this was all caught on camera. Now, remember that this is before the age of the internet, before cell phones. So it just happened that someone about one o'clock in the morning happened to pull out a camcorder from his trunk and filmed all of this and made the evening news. And eventually all of this went to trial. But it should come as no surprise that the officers were found not guilty of their actions. So because of this, there was a lot of craziness in Los Angeles right about the time the verdicts were announced. Um, LA erupted in violence for about a week or so. And all of this started um, in a part of South LA, a corner, Florence and Normandy. And I remember being a sophomore here at Caltech and I turned on the news and realized that the intersection where they were showing all of this starting that afternoon was about two blocks away from my house where I grew up in LA. So a lot of what happened back 30 years ago really had a profound impact on me as an undergraduate here. Um, at the time, there really were not any Black students from Los Angeles. So um, the California Tech, the student newspaper, wanted to run an article just to kind of talk about locally what did this mean for the students that were here. Um, you'll see here on the screen, this is the shot of the front cover of the California Tech from May 22nd, 1992. And they had this little article where they said, Caltech students affected by LA riots and the King verdict. Um, myself and Danny, the same grad student that I mentioned is here in aeronautical engineering, were the two that were profiled here in this article. Um, really the reporter just wanted to ask us about what did it mean to kind of be from LA? How did this really affect you on campus? How did this affect the other black students on campus? But what I'll say is instead of really focusing on the article, since Danny and I were involved with the local Nesby chapter, we wanted to do something about it. So at the time, we took the Nesby chapter and we went back to my old elementary school, Raymond Avenue Elementary, which is about a block away from Florence and Normandy. And we, as part of Nesby, started to have things like math tutorials and play a few math games to kind of work with some of the elementary school kids. So here's a photo actually of the 
old Nesby chapter. I have no idea who even took this photo and I don't even know how I found this. Of myself and Danny, we were actually there at Raymond Avenue. Um, it was probably somewhere around a month or so after this article here was written. So it was actually really nice that we were able to take the local Nesby chapter and go back to the community to try to do a few things. Because of that, I was much more interested in general about the lives of Black students at Caltech. Um, I did a surf in summer of 1993, where I started to look at the history of the Black students. I really were, was asking very general things like, who was the very first Black student as an undergraduate? Who was the first as a graduate student? What are some of the stories of the students that were here? And really, that led me into a very complicated search in trying to come up with some of the answers to those questions. Um, in my senior year, 93, 94, I decided to write a series of articles for the student newspaper, actually 10 articles, where I outlined a lot of the findings that I was coming up with as part of my SERP and also as part of working inside of the history department. Um, you can always look up the articles in the California Tech. They just all appear online in the archives. Um, also in the history department, I had a history display where I not only talked about, say, like just very general things in Black history, but very specifically, some of the alumni that I found out about um, were all profiled there in, in Baxter. So here you see on the screen just a few photos of some of the things that were happening during my senior year. Now, after I graduated Caltech, I went on, had a totally different life. Um, I was actually a double major in mathematics and physics. History was just something that was part of my passion, but technically I wasn't a history major. I would eventually go on to graduate from Stanford University. Um, I came back to Caltech as a postdoc in 1993, 2003. So that's where I was actually teaching classes in the mathematics department. I eventually went on and had a tenure track position and got tenure at Purdue University in the Midwest. But one of those summers, I decided to come back and help to run FSRI. So this is the Freshman Summer Research Institute. Um, so really, I was very much involved with the life of FSRI pretty much since it started back in 1991 or so. Um, so where my relationship with Caltech gets complicated is I was an undergraduate here, I was a postdoc, so I was on the faculty, and I was a staff member. So when people ask me about the relationship that I have with Caltech, I pretty much just say yes, because I've kind of done all these different things. Now, I was fortunate, and when I came back to California in 2018, the Alumni Association really was very interested in trying to learn more about some of the history that I helped to uncover as an undergraduate. In fact, there was an unveiling of a Black History Month display almost exactly three years ago, actually exactly three years ago here to the day, where over in, I guess now it's called Caltech Hall, um, formerly Millican Library, in the Board of Trustees room, they had this wonderful exhibit where they put out, say, profiles of various alumni. They also talked about, say, just some of the faculty that are here on campus. So here's just a few that I'll kind of mention. Um, David Van Valen, of course, is a faculty member here. He used to be a graduate student here. Um, Bill Hutchinson, I believe, was probably the oldest living Black alumni. I'm not completely sure. But I first met him when I was an undergraduate, and he was very involved with the Nesby chapter. Um, Lindley Williamson Chu is a student. She was a student who was here when I was here. She was one of the few Black women who was here on campus during my time. Um, I'm not sure if this exhibit is still up, but after they moved everything outside of Caltech Hall, they had a temporary exhibit up in Beckman Institute. I haven't been over there in a couple of years to know if it's still there, but when I went back a couple of years ago, it was still up. So if you do want to maybe see a little bit about some of these profiles and learn a little bit about Caltech history, um, hopefully it's at Beckman Institute, uh, but they did a really great job in just outlining a lot of these, um, these um, alums. So let me now say, what are some of the questions that I tried to answer when I was really interested in learning about the history of Caltech students? Very specifically, I wanna to try to answer the questions, who were the first black undergraduates and what are some of their stories? I did uncover that the very first black student to graduate from Caltech is Grant Delbert Venerable. Um, he actually is a very interesting case. He was an undergraduate at UCLA that was majoring in mathematics. He would have finished in 1927, but apparently there were some issues with his credits and he was technically disqualified. So he decided to transfer to Caltech. So in 1929, he was the first black student to start at Caltech and he was very active for various clubs on campus. Um, he was a member of back then, um, well nowadays what would be called the Caltech Y. He was part of the American Society of Engineers. He ran on the track team. 
He was also very much active with the Cosmopolitan Club. And this is kind of a club that used to focus on various cultures all around the world. You can see here at the lower right of your screen, a shot of the Cosmopolitan Club. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of a Nobel Prize winner by the name of William Shockley. He was also part of this class as well. And actually he appears here in this photo. In 1932, he graduated, venerable that is, graduated with his bachelor's in civil engineering. And he went on to have a pretty good career. Um, he would go on to work as an engineer, own and operate his own motel. And eventually he would operate um, an erasure manufacturing company. And so in 1989, his family established a book fund. This is actually how I found out about Brent Venerable. There was someone who worked as a staff member here on campus who just happened to know about this book fund. And she sent me a book that actually had kind of a, um, a description inside of it. And that's how I personally found out about Brent Venerable. Um, apparently Caltech News had actually known about this for years and years, but unfortunately it was just buried. And a lot of people just didn't know about this. So I personally try to get the story about Grant Venerable, about the family, and also about the book fund whenever I get the opportunity to. Um, I think probably a lot of you have heard about Venerable more recently because um, there was a series of renamings here on campus. And as part of that, um, one of the undergraduate dorms here named Ruddock House has now been named to Venerable House. And I have to admit that for me, that was a really great thing to hear because again, I've been really trying to hype up Grant Venerable's name. So the fact that it's actually going to live on here on campus um, it certainly means a lot to me. The second black student to graduate from Caltech is James Quincy Denton. Now this is an interesting name because I personally did not know about this name until about three years ago. And not a lot of people actually do know this name. So this is one of the first times that I think anyone here at Caltech has actually heard about this person. Um, Denton was born in 1929 in Lincoln, Nebraska, but his family soon moved when he was younger to Santa Barbara. Um, he started here at Caltech, I believe in 1947, although I'm not completely sure about that, but he was very much involved with campus and in life in Pasadena while he was here. Apparently he played the French horn for the Pasadena Symphony. One interesting thing about Denton is while he had a full academic scholarship, there were issues I believe dealing with race that prohibited him from living on campus. And I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later. There actually were some very complicated relationships that black students had with the city of Pasadena that I think kind of gets lost in translation when we get these stories here. By 1951, Denton would graduate on Phi Beta Kappa with a bachelor's in chemistry. And I wanna point out that while he wasn't the first black student to graduate from Caltech, he is the first non-transfer student to graduate from Caltech. So you will see some people say that Denton was the first black student, that is not true. Some people argue that he was the first black student who didn't transfer in from another school, that is true. Um, after graduation, he had a really interesting life. He worked for JPL for a while. He was in, in the Korean War. He decided to go back to school to get his PhD in chemistry from the University of Oregon. And then he had a completely different life. He would go to Amherst College where he would become the first black professor Remember, he had an undergrad degree in chemistry, but he became a statistician at Amherst. So I personally am very interested, since I'm in mathematics myself, that Amherst hired the first black mathematician on campus as someone who got their degree from Caltech. But curiously, that degree is not actually in math, it's actually in chemistry. Um, but in 2005, he retired from Amherst and he passed away just a few years ago. Um, actually, I first heard about him just as he passed away. I guess that the Alumni Association had known about him, but I don't think any of the other Black students on campus here had known about him, except for the last few years. And the third Black student who was here is Charles Holswell Magruder III. Um, he started at Caltech in 1961 and would eventually graduate four years later in 65 with a bachelor's in astronomy. Um, he lived in Ricketts House, you can actually see here in the bottom right hand part of the screen, just a screenshot of um, what the seniors look like in the yearbook from 1965. Um, due to the politics of the day, he really didn't believe in living in the US as a black man, so he decided to move abroad. And in 1974, he got his PhD in astronomy from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. In fact, he really was convinced that he was not going to come back to the US, but one thing after another happened, and he would move back. Um, he moved to Western Kentucky University in 1993, and he's basically been there ever since then. Um, he's now the William McCormick Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Western Kentucky, but for a couple of years, he was also president 
of the National Society of Black Physicists. Um, I can tell you that when I was an undergraduate, I was very much involved with the National Society of Black Physicists. I would go to the conferences every year and I actually met Professor Magruder several times. I had no idea that he was a Caltech alum. He was just someone that I would meet at the conferences and we'd have really great conversations. Um, even now, we still do talk by email. I still just try to keep him up to date on things that are happening here at Caltech, but he's still very, very much involved in the Black business community. I wanna show you this photo here. This is actually one of my favorite photos. This is actually just from three years ago. I was really surprised when I saw this. Um, this was taken at the national meeting of the National Society of Black Physicists when it was in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm still a little bit bitter that I wasn't able to go to this conference, just my teaching schedule was too hectic. I even had undergraduates that went to this conference at Providence. But here you have four very well-known physicists that all took a photo together. On the very left, you have Jim Gates. Um, he's arguably the most famous black physicist on the planet today. Um, he was at the University of Maryland College Park for many years, now he's at Brown University. Um, you might have seen various specials about him on PBS and on NOVA. Um, he's been here to Caltech several times to give various talks. Um, he's currently the president of the American Physical Society. Um, and he's just really been my mentor ever since I was an undergraduate. But he's just an extremely impressive individual. On the very right of the screen, you have Charles Magruder. Um, so remember, the person I was talking about at Washington, Kentucky. And in the middle, you actually see two of their children. Um, Delia Gates is actually right next to Jim Gates. She was a graduate student in physics at Harvard University, and she just graduated not even a year ago. Um, and I know that Jim Gates is just over the moon that his daughter decided to actually follow his footsteps and go into theoretical physics. And I can tell you that she's as badass as it sounds. You know, I mean, you, you have to be pretty good to get a PhD in physics from Harvard. Then to Charles's right is his son, Chima Magruder, who's also a grad student at Harvard in physics. Um, I haven't heard whether Chima has graduated or not. I assume that probably by now, um, either he has graduated or is very close. But what's really cool is that in this picture here, um, Jim Gates and Charles Magruder have known each other for years and years. They were both presidents of the National Society of Black Physicists at some point or another. And now both of their children are going into theoretical physics. And hopefully they're also gonna follow their footsteps and be in professors one day. So this picture is really just a beautiful picture and kind of the generations to kind of show you um, how people are doing nowadays. Now, at this point, Charles Magruder had graduated in 1965. And so now you might ask the question, were there more black students that came in after 1965? Just more generally, what was life like at Caltech in the late 1960s? So I want to try to take you on a larger tour to kind of say what was happening on campus back then and also what was happening more generally in the United States at the time. So let me start with this shot. It's actually an article that was in the California Tech from January 11th, 1968. Um, as you probably know, a lot of schools, Caltech was no different, were not admitting women as undergraduates to the institution. They were always admitting women as graduate students, but just not as undergraduates. So in January, 1968, the Board of Trustees decided to have an, a study so that they could determine how they would bring in women as undergraduates. Um, <clears throat> they put out this call for study in January of 1968. And what amazes me is by the end of that calendar year in November, 1968, the Board of Trustees got the report back they then discussed it and they voted that yes, women should be admitted as undergraduates to Caltech. So, you know, you might think that maybe it takes three, four years for this conversation, but no, it actually did move relatively quickly. Now, there were a few different restrictions that they had, things like not more than 5% of the incoming class should have been women for the first few years. There were also a lot of questions as to how might this change, let's say just really the culture on campus, um, a lot of people were really pushing to say that this is a good thing, that this should happen. Of course, there were a lot of people pushing that this will be a bad thing. But I, instead of really trying to discuss the story in more detail, I will say that it does have a happy ending. Caltech News a few years ago did keep up with the first four women that started at Caltech in 1970 and 1971. They did graduate by about 1973 or so. And just coming up next year will be the 50th anniversary of women graduating from Caltech as undergraduates. Um, I don't want to talk more about this story today because that's going to take me far field 
from where I want to go. But I do want to say that kind of as things started in January of 1968, it's pretty much a success story. Instead, I want to try to focus on this small part of that front page from November 1968 that you might have missed if you didn't pay close attention to it. So that front cover said, you know, um, girls coming to tech, you know, this idea that women were going to be admitted as undergraduates come in. But right below that, there's this article here that states right away, this year, 1968, there are no black freshmen. So in 1968, while things were starting to change, in some sense for racial minorities, things were still pretty bad. Now the article does go on to say that there were five black students on campus. I have to admit, I don't know who those five students are. I would really love to learn this. But what I wanna do is try to spend the rest of the time really going over what was happening in 1968 and what are some of the stories of these five black students that were on campus at the time? So let me kind of take a step back to say, what was happening in the United States that year in 1968? Well, us being here at Caltech, you know, we are very much interested in science. And I have to tell you that one of my favorite photos is this one here is called Earthrise. Um, it's a picture from the Apollo 8 mission as it was orbiting around the moon. I remember that we didn't actually land on the moon until July of 1969. So at this point, we were still just trying to have our test missions to see if we can at least go to the moon and come back. So this is one of the first photos ever taken of the Earth from another body. So I personally just am, am always impressed by, by what this, this picture represents. So this is in December, 1968. This is kind of at the end of the year. And this is really on the cusp of the US really thinking that it's winning the space race and that maybe eventually we're gonna make it to the moon one day. But on other societal issues, 68 was a very tumultuous year. Um, in June of 1968, the front runner for the presidential campaign that summer was Robert Kennedy. He was assassinated at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. And remember that at this point, the incumbent president, Lyndon Johnson, decided not to run. So this meant that the entire election was completely thrown into chaos that summer. Um, the person that a lot of people did not want was Richard Nixon, and he eventually did become president in 1968. So a lot of people were really starting to have um, a lot of uh, questions about really the, the stability of the electoral process that summer. Earlier that year, in April 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And this, of course, was a huge blow to the United States. Um, there were riots that took place in many cities all throughout the country. Um, here's just a couple of photos of the riots that took place in Washington, DC, and also some of the ones that took place in Baltimore, but really cities all over the United States were, were burning. Um, the president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, did actually use this in some sense to his benefit to try to pass various laws so that things would be a little bit more fair in terms of civil rights. Um, one of the civil rights acts that he passed was the so-called Fair Housing Act. Um, you may remember that I mentioned that um, one of the students, James Denton, was having trouble just getting housing in Pasadena. It turned out that if you actually interview various other Black alums, especially graduate students, when they were here back in the 50s and 60s, they will tell you that there were housing covenants in the city of Pasadena that basically Blacks were not allowed to be rented to in the city. And a lot of them had to move as far away as Altadena. Now you can maybe imagine being a graduate student here in Pasadena, not being able to get housing anywhere near campus, not having to figure out how to have transportation from Altadena and back every day. And remember, this is back in the time when grad students were not able to afford cars. So this was certainly very difficult for a lot of students that were here in the area. So this housing act really did mean something specific, something concrete for a lot of students that were here in the area. Now, I wanna say a little bit more about this idea here of the Housing Act. And I wanna go over something that the Caltech Y did back in the late 1960s that was a little bit controversial, but I think that, that still they, they were onto something here. They had a program that they called the Ghetto in the City. Now, to also kind of help you get a better idea of how things were here in Pasadena, um, various alumni, that is black students who were grad students here in the area, used to tell me about an issue here with these swimming pools. Um, so I found this here on this Black History in Pasadena website, and I'll just read you what it says here. There was the municipal pool in the city of Pasadena called the Brookside Plunge. You can actually see pictures of this. You know, it's a very well-known pool in Pasadena. They opened this in 1914, but they started a day that they called Negro Day. The idea is that your pool, of course, is gonna have a lot of people in the city that are gonna be using it. 
and the pool has to be cleaned once a week. Essentially what they would do is they would ban Negroes and other people of color from swimming in the pool until the day before it was to be cleaned. So it was going to be cleaned on Wednesday, which meant that Negroes and other people of color could only use the pool that Tuesday before. That meant that a lot of people here in Pasadena pretty much did not use the pool. I can say that this is one of these unfortunate things that still affects Black Americans in a very subtle way today. A lot of Black Americans actually even now don't know how to swim because generationally their parents decided not to swim in these pools and it's just been a really unfortunate thing year after year. So again, I've talked to a lot of alum that were very aware about this idea here of Negro Day with the pools, but this is something that you might not have known about unless you really have interviewed various Black alum that are here. So with this, students at Caltech were very much aware that there was almost like a completely different world even here in the city of Pasadena. Perhaps they were students here, very involved with campus life, but they didn't quite realize what was happening even just across the street in the city of Pasadena. Well, the Caltech Y started this experiment where what they wanted to do was have about 20 undergraduates live and work for about three, four days in the black neighborhood in Pasadena. Um, essentially, they were just gonna be there to be around, let's say the social workers, construction workers, just to see what life was like. And this is actually chronicled in several issues of the student newspaper. Um, roughly in about January 18th in, in the California Tech in 1968, they do try to list some of the ideas, some of the reasoning behind why they're going to try to do this. And then just about a week or so later, they then have the students to actually talk about what's the experience that they had. And as you might imagine, um, if you actually read this here from the January 25th article, it does say that they were very, very surprised at what they saw. They thought that they were gonna see things like slums and rats and disease and poverty, but instead what they found was really nice, well-kept houses, very clean houses, but they just realized that there was just a lot of miscommunication, misunderstanding about what a quote unquote ghetto was. And also just really a, not much of an understanding of how institutionalized racism worked. So you might think that something like this was very controversial, you know, taking white students to live among um, black citizens in the city of Pasadena, but it seemed that this type of cultural exchange really didn't mean a lot for the students that were here. There also were a couple of other articles that came out about three months later to really talk about the long lasting effect of this idea of the ghetto in the city from the Caltech Y. What I found surprising in this issue of the student newspaper is that there was kind of a double whammy of on the one hand really saying that having this program with the Caltech Y gave people a slightly different way to think about race relations. But on the other hand, this issue here came out about two to three weeks after King's assassination. And these editorials here state that nothing on campus was even done about King's assassination. It says that the flag here, I think the one right outside um, Caltech Hall was maybe at half mass for a day, but that was it. That there were no other discussions on campus, nothing else that I have found was even written in the student newspaper about all of this. So even then, even in 1968, there were still some complaints amongst the students and the faculty that more needed to be done, more discussion needed to happen on campus from these incidents, from these, these larger political issues happening outside of campus. So that's an idea I wanna come back to later as well. So this is what was happening in 1968, not just here at Caltech, but also in general in the US, so let me come back to that question I asked before about the five black students on Caltech's campus. I really only wanna focus on one in particular, someone by the name of Joseph Rhodes. Um, I'm just wondering by show of hands, has anybody here heard the name Joseph Rhodes? Yeah, so this, this actually kind of depresses me a little bit. Um, when I first started to do my research on the history of black students at Caltech, various people emailed me right away saying, you have to know about Joseph Rhodes. Um, I argue he is the most impressive black student to graduate from, from Caltech. Um, he grew up in Pittsburgh. Um, his father was actually African-American and his mother was Filipina. They actually met during World War II, but then they eventually moved together and married in Pittsburgh. Joseph Rose was an undergraduate here at Caltech from 1965 to 1969, and he majored in history. But during his undergraduate term here, he served twice as the student body president, as the president of ASCII. 
After he graduated from Caltech, he went on to Harvard University where he was the junior fellow and decided to research racism in Victoria, England. And from there, he got involved in local politics. Um, he moved back to Pennsylvania where he was involved with the House of Representatives. He was reelected there for three consecutive terms. And that's just kind of just the start of his career, various things that he did. So he was very active when he was a student here, very active in campus politics. And it turned out that he was very active in local state politics as well. Um, you'll actually notice that there's a Wikipedia page written about him and there's just a lot of literature written on just what he's done and just the impact that he had on American politics. So I'm gonna spend maybe the next 10 minutes or so actually going over who he was and what he did while he was here on campus. So let me start back during his sophomore year in 1967, where he decided to first run for president of ASCIT. And it was kind of a silly thing because apparently originally he wasn't even eligible to run. There was some small change in the laws. And so he did eventually decide to run in February of that year. Um, he did get elected, I think, which really surprised a lot of people. And there's some interesting discussions in the Caltech paper about how to describe him, whether or not he's Negro or he's Asian or exactly what. But still, he did win as student body president in 1967. Um, apparently, he was very vocal on campus about many things. He actually wrote various letters to the California Tech where he was trying to say that students here really need to be a little bit more politically active on campus. Um, he was very much worried about how much power the administration had, how little voice that the administration gave to the students. I hope some of this is kind of sounding familiar to today's campus. And so he would just write letter after letter to kind of tell the student body, you also want to be a little bit more involved with the politics here on campus. He also had various forums as the ASCAP presidents do, where he really wanted to get out and kind of talk to students to kind of see what are some of the things that they needed. He was also very much active in chatting with the president of Caltech at the time, Lee Dubridge. And you just see really article after article where Joseph Rhodes and Lee Dubridge are either going back and forth or where they have various letters in the student papers. But you know, the, the two of them certainly it was well known that they had a good relationship, although they were both very critical of each other. So this is about 1967. In 1968, a year later, Rose does decide to run for office a second time. And again, a second time, he does very, very well. Um, here's just a quick photo just to kind of show um, Joseph Rose here on the very first row, but you know, all the different people that are running for ASCIT back then. But he actually does very well in the second election. Apparently he wins two to one. He gets about 200 votes and his nearest opponent gets only about 100 votes or so. So he's very popular here on campus and is doing very well. Now, remember I mentioned before that Joseph Rhodes spoke quite a bit in the campus paper. So he wrote this very long and I think very controversial article where he puts forth what he calls the Caltech myth. So I'm gonna slow down for a little bit and try to tell you what this means because it, it is a little bit complicated the way he lays all of this out. He first starts by saying that all of us believe that Caltech is a great place that has a great education that it will position us to be great people and be great scientists in the world. However, he says that that's only one part of what it means to have a great education. He puts forth this idea that there are a lot of things happening in society that aren't relegated to just science. A lot of the politics that we're seeing about social justice issues and what have you. And he then puts forth this argument that Caltech is not as great as we think it is, because as long as we ignore all of the social issues happening outside of campus, we are not doing society any good. He goes even further to say that there's a lot of students that just kind of get caught up in just wanting to be a scientist, that they kind of lose their identities, they lose their cultures, and that they're no longer individuals, they're almost like automatons. And that he believes really is also helping to drive down Caltech being a great place. So he writes this very long editorial where he really tries to state, it's a myth that Caltech is the best school in the country because there are certain things that Caltech is doing that are really holding it back. Um, I, I can tell you that when I read this, this resonated very much to me because when I was an undergraduate, I felt very much the same way. You know, Caltech is certainly unrivaled when it comes to science education, but I do worry very much that there isn't any discussion at all about the policies happening outside of campus. I mean, remember even when I was an undergraduate, 
the LA riots were happening and there was very little discussion about it here on campus. Well, as you might imagine, when he puts forth this editorial, there was a lot of backlash. Um, there were several editorials that came out really rebuking him, saying that he was along the wrong path, that they really weren't happy that he was trying to criticize Caltech in this way. Now, remember, only about two months before, he won like 60% of the vote. So it's really fascinating to me that here now, because he's being critical of Caltech, even though he's already been asked of president for a year, even though he knows the campus very well, just because he's criticizing Caltech with this editorial, he's getting a lot of backlash. Um, even right after this, it's interesting that there is a petition that's then circulated around campus to recall Joseph Rhodes as president. Now, again, he had just been elected president maybe three months before, but already there's this petition that's going around. Um, fortunately, nothing happened with this petition. Just a lot of people started to complain, but nothing happened at all. He would still remain to be president. And one of the last things that I found in the student newspaper was here, um, an interview that he did with the new Caltech president, Harold Brown, just about Caltech and his future. Um, at this point, remember that because he's asked the president, he really just wants to ask the new president about his ideas about Caltech, where Caltech is going to go. He doesn't so much ask about questions dealing with race as you might expect. There was a lot of questions at the time about Caltech being involved with things like defense contracts, how much it was involved with the war in Vietnam, so that was a lot of what Joseph Rose was trying to get at in the interview that he did with Harold Brown here, kind of what's happening with Caltech and its relationship with, with the military. So this is 1969. And remember that Joseph Rhodes graduates from Caltech in the summer, summer of 69. So I wanna say just a little bit of what happened to him after he graduated from Caltech. So as I mentioned, he went on to Harvard University where he was a junior fellow but he also got very much involved with politics at the national level. So at the time, Richard Nixon was president and there were a few shootings on college campuses, really unarmed student protesters that were shot by police. You might remember the ones that happened at Kent State in Ohio. There was also one that not a lot of people know about that was at um, Jackson State University in Mississippi, but there was a commission that was put together to kind of look at these things that were happening. Joseph Rhodes was assigned to this commission. He was actually the youngest member and the only current student that was on this commission. Well, as part of this appointment, of course, um, this was very much a very visible type of thing. Um, Rhodes gave a few interviews. In fact, one interview in particular was to the New York Times where he specifically said, if President Nixon and Vice President Agnew's statements are killing people, I want to know that. He was very, very critical publicly with the president and the vice president. In fact, so much so that this made like the front cover of the New York Times. There were various cartoons and other political ads that were put out to really kind of discuss this. Spiro Agnew publicly called for Rhodes' resignation. Rhodes actually refused. And the New York Times actually made a lot of fun of Spiro Agnew saying that here this was the student at Harvard that stood up against the vice president and the student won. I mean, I personally was really floored when I was seeing all of these articles back and forth from the New York Times about Joseph Rose, but for some reason, people here at Caltech don't seem to know any, any of this stuff. Um, later on, Joseph Rose was cited by Time Magazine as one of the 200 new leaders of America. Um, he received a Democratic Action National Youth Award in 1971. And apparently Joseph Rose says that he's the most proud about that he was named on the master list of Nixon's political opponents as he served the Nixon administration as part of this Presidential Commission, and even the Wikipedia article goes on to say that he included this on his resume afterwards. Um, so unfortunately, Joseph Rose passed away maybe about 10 years ago or so. You know, I really would have loved to have Caltech to do a little bit more about him and about his life. But certainly if you wanted to learn more about Joseph Rose, there's a lot that's out there on the internet. Um, I personally find him to be a fascinating person. But I think in general, what I like about Joseph Rhodes is he was a scientist, he was a scholar, but he didn't let any of that hold him back for being a political activist. And he's certainly someone that, that I really aspire to in what I do these days. Um, even as a professor, I really try to take a look at what's happening outside of the campus where I am and still try to bring some of that back to the campus for students to think about. 
So with that, let me thank you for your time and attention. And I do hope that we can have a conversation about some of this. Big deal. We're about 10 minutes in, so there's time for questions. Yeah, I'm also looking to see here if there's any in the chat window. Uh, I think I can be heard from here. If there's anyone in Zoom that wants to ask, feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat. Um, yes. So it seems like there's a huge big gap in between the better and following. Is there any explanation for that? Uh, so, so the question is that there seems to be a pretty big gap between when Venerable started and when the, the next student started, 47 or so. Um, I think it just comes down to several factors. I mean, one, back at the time, not a lot of Black Americans were going to college. You know, I mean, th there was things like um, racism and housing laws. And I mean, you know, you have it. It just, it just was not a place for, for Black students to go. Um, I think also Caltech can just be very elitist in terms of kind of the students that it wants, the students that it takes. I mean, remember that even at 68, they said that they had no black students coming in in the freshman class. What I didn't get a chance to show here is that there was a front page article, I believe for the Chronicle of Higher Education, maybe in the year 20, 2001, that had the same exact title. There were no black freshmen in the incoming class at Caltech. So, I mean, yes, it was a problem back then, but it's still kind of an ongoing problem that happens every so frequently. I do know that this year's freshman class has the largest that's ever come in in the history of Caltech. Um, but I would still caution that sometimes these things are in cycles. Um, you know, again, when I came in in 1990, that was the largest set of black students that had ever come in. Now you have here 2022, and again, people are saying this is the largest set of black students that's ever come in. But a couple of years before I got here in 1990, there were zero black students in the freshman class. And again, in like the year 2001 or so, there were zero black students in the freshman class. So I, I think that you're asking the right question. Like, why is it that there can be these blocks of years where no black students come in? I don't have a perfect answer for this, but, but I will say that is something I think you need to be careful of and not just simply think, well, the numbers are getting much better now. They will always be that because the history they show other things. Yes. I'm curious about the kind of interaction between this um, black ghetto that you talked about and the testing the housing laws. Because uh -huh. it was in custody, right? So were those right. uh, homeowners or how did they come about? So yeah, so there's a question here about I guess the, the housing laws in Pasadena, and then also like this this ghetto project that the Caltech Y had. Um my understanding is that there weren't a lot of black homeowners in the city of Pasadena. There were many more in the city of Altadena. So Altadena historically has always had a very large thriving black community. Pasadena was a bit more complicated. Um, one of the basic laws about housing in Pasadena was let's say if you either owned a house or rented a house, you could not sell or rent to anyone black. Like that was actually what was written on the books. So of course it got very complicated because let's say if you were someone white and wanted to sell it to someone black, you legally could not do that. Which meant that legally it was almost impossible for anyone black to own a house in Pasadena unless they had had it in their family you know, for generations and generations. Um, I don't know a lot of this idea of the ghetto in Pasadena, like where that was or what that looked like. That's something that I'm actively trying to look at now. So. Um, yeah, maybe at some point I can try to tell you a little bit more, but that that's something I really don't know a whole lot about. Yes. So we have a question in chat. Uh huh. Yeah. Let me see. All right. Oh, okay. Oh, it's Jackie. Uh -huh. Hi, Jackie. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Hi. Can Can you hear me on Zoom? Um, I can hear you. I don't know if the audience can. Yeah, if you can try that again, let's see. Oh. Um. Hi. <laughs> I was just wondering. Oh, I'm, I'm on Zoom because. I was a little sick and I just wanted to be safe. But um, thank you so much. That was a really, really informative um, presentation. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I had no idea about the last person that you mentioned. Um, sorry, what was his name? The Joseph Rose. Yeah, that is such a cool story. I really wish he was still alive and we could, you know, bring him. Um, but so you say like you're inspired by him and, you know, you do a lot of work as a professor um, to you know, be politically active and aware at least. Um, how does that, like, 
what what does that like bring to your community in terms of maybe backlash that you get like do you get any backlash from your colleagues or from any students or is it mostly like positive I'm sure there's lots of positive from from the students but I'm curious because I have had other people tell me that you know they want to do this but they're afraid of being seen as just an activist and no longer a scientist like do you feel like that is something that people project on you or I don't know if you get what I mean yeah yeah I, I do yeah no thanks for that question um, I think that there's a few different ways to think of it you know I'm very fortunate that I'm at Pomona College now which is small liberals arts college but the people there are very liberal they're very politically active and the students make it very clear they want to see social justice issues integrated in the classroom yeah. Um, I'm coming from spending 14 years at Purdue University, which is the total opposite. You know, it's very conservative. You know, for example, I think Trump basically carried the state like um, when, when he ran, um, I didn't think that Obama carried the state his second term. I know the first term he did, but I think the second term he did here in Indiana. Um, the students there are also very conservative and they make it very clear that they don't want to hear about social justice issues. The faculty aren't so much about that, but certainly the faculty would say that they would rather focus on just the math and not focus on anything else. Yeah. So what I'll say is that um, I don't experience backlash at Pomona, but mm -hmm. I did experience backlash at Purdue. Um, it really comes down to how much you really want to listen to what other people have to say. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to experience backlash, you might experience some encouragement, but I mean, is it any fair that you're not going to do something because you're worried about the backlash? versus doing something only because it makes you feel good because other people want you to do it. You know, I mean, to mm -hmm. me, you have to do it because it's your own personal conviction. And if somebody else likes it or doesn't like it, like that really shouldn't be a factor. It should be, if there's something that you think is important or something that you want to do, then, then I would just say, go ahead and do it. Um, it is true though, that you can maybe make more of a difference depending on how far along you are in your, are in your career and how much power you have. But I would say, don't let, worrying about how much power you will have hold you back from doing things now. You know, when I was an undergraduate, I was still very, very involved politically on campus. And one of the things I was very concerned with was how were the Black students doing? Mm -hmm. when, when I first got here, um, there was a guy who was running the Minority Student Affairs Office named Lee Brown. And Lee used to have the saying of he would have all the minority students in a room kind of freshman year so that everybody would get to know each other. And the very first thing he would say is, look to your left, look to your right. Of the three of you, only one of you will be here at the end of your four years. And he was completely right. So of the 14 Black students that came in in 1990, only five of us eventually graduated. Um, so I personally got very concerned with just things like checking up on the Black students, making sure that they were getting the tutors they need, or that they were surviving mentally and emotionally. I was acutely aware the students were going to drop out. And so even as an undergraduate, I wanted to make sure to check up on people. Like, you know, no, I didn't have power to change any things about like hiring or getting new faculty or admitting grad students. I was aware of that and that wasn't gonna be my mission anyway. But I knew that I could do something about checking up on the students every day. And that's something yeah. that I did. So yeah, so I would just say, you know, kind of find something that's important to you, go with your convictions and don't worry at all about whether there's gonna be any backlash. That's really powerful. Yeah, I think that's kind of what the student group that we have at Gauss does. We just focus on each other. <laughs> you know, faculty are going to do what they want to do, but we just support each other. So that's that's really great to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have, or have you looked into representing black people on like the admissions side or like or? Yeah, so there's a question here about, I'm um, looking at representation on things like the Board of Trustees or the admissions office. Um, a little bit. I personally haven't really done like, you know, a hardcore analysis of the numbers. I only know a lot of anecdotal stories. Um, so for example, with the Board of Trustees, um, there have only been maybe two Blacks, maybe three on the Board of Trustees, I believe. Um, the two that are on there now are Shirley Malcolm and Mason Smith. Um, I wanna say, I believe maybe there was another person before Shirley Malcolm got on there, I'm not completely sure. Um, but Dr. Malcolm's been on the board now since like 1993, 92, something like that. So she's been on there for about 30 years or so. Um, 
I worry a little bit more about representation from the admissions office. Um, I know that things are better now um, based on the staff that they have there. But when I say worry, it isn't so much about like making sure that students get admitted. It's more a worry of finding the right students to apply and really encouraging students to come here. So Lee Brown, who was this director of minority student affairs for 30 years, something like this, he kind of started at Caltech roughly in 1965 and then he retired in 1990. So I was the last group of students that he helped to admit. Um, he never had a PhD, he was not a Caltech professor, but he had a lot of contacts in the city of Pasadena. He actually worked as a high school teacher. Um, he would sometimes teach some of the students of the Caltech professors, and that helped him to get to know the Pasadena area very, very well. He would actually know what it meant to get into Caltech, but then also he knew about a lot of minority students in the area and what have you. The way he got the numbers to change himself were he would send an application to the top minority students in the country. That's how I got my application from Caltech. There were two of us that were considered to be like the two top black students in the city of Los Angeles in 1990. And we both got applications from Caltech. So, I mean, I knew that I wanted to go to Caltech anyway, but it really meant a lot that I actively got an application from Caltech in the mail. Um, I actually joke with people that I requested an application from MIT and I never got one, which is why I never applied to MIT. But I mean, Caltech did send me one. This is what Lee Brown would do. He would just find the top students, send them an application actively, and then they would go ahead and they would apply. And of course, nowadays you have the common app and things are a little bit different. But back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the way you would apply to a school is you'd have to physically get an application. So if they had one in their mailbox already, that would convince a lot of students to go that one extra step of applying. Um, I would like to see more proactive things like that, you know, really saying, we need to kind of be in the face of the students to really convince them to apply. Um, I'm not gonna be critical of the alumni of the admissions office now because I honestly don't know. I would just say that one of the things I worry about Caltech more generally, and I think this applies for the undergrad admissions as well as graduate admissions, is there's an arrogance of Caltech is a great place. Everybody wants to be here. Why do we have to go out and recruit? Um, I can tell you that that was something that I saw when I was in the math department and it was very, very frustrating because you're gonna have a lot of people that are not going to apply to Caltech. And that's what's gonna keep the numbers, you know, in terms of having a diverse set of students to be very low. Um, so I would like to see much more of that in things like the undergraduate admissions process, especially in the graduate admissions process for the different graduate departments to really say we have to be much more proactive. It's not so much about the diversity of the people who work in those, it's just more understanding that if you wanna get the numbers to change, you really have to be proactive. You just can't sit back and just say, well, we don't know why they're not applying. You know, that's really not gonna work. Well, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you all.